How's it going everybody? Welcome back to the Satoshi Club where today I'm going to talk about central bank digital currencies or digital coins or central bank stable coins. Now, why am I going to tie this story in with stable coins? And by the way, you can check out my previous stable coin war video if you just click the link up there. But I'm tying it in with stable coins because what we're going to need is a lot more regulation to stop stuff such as, you know, the UST crash that happened earlier this year. And just to tie it all in, you know, we have a lot of stuff going on in today's world that makes volatility something that people are trying to avoid more and more in the market, which could be eliminated or, you know, drastically reduced with the uh, introduction of regulation. So currently what we're seeing is stock market is crashing. Crypto is basically going down as well. Uh, Terra USD or UST, uh, an algorithmic stable coin, which I'm going to touch upon soon, just to remind you guys uh, of types of stable coins, uh, you know, it crashed and it sent a lot of people uh, wondering, okay, what about if USDT crashes? What if BUSD crashes? What if USDC crashes? You know, what if these companies are not doing their best to actually back the asset that they're trying to back? And what's the one way you could guarantee that? Well, you could guarantee it if you had a country backing its stablecoin, right? Same as when you have a huge bank, right? And, uh, you know, people start for, like in the 2008 financial crisis where the government actually interfered and gave these banks a lot of liquidity so they're able to survive the huge bank run of people just coming in and trying to withdraw their funds. So what happened? The government or the central bank, uh, you know, it, it interfered and the same would happen with CBDC. So currently what we have in the world is a war going on. We have huge supply chain disruptions. We have questions about food, food security. Uh, viruses, all of this stuff ha happening and, you know, the highest inflation in 40 years to top it all off. And, you know, the market's very volatile, right? It's pretty scary as well. Uh, in the US, you know, and around the world on, on the market in general, financial markets are trying to process a tightening of the monetary policies. Um, the Fed is increasing rates. Powell is over there speaking online on TV every single week, which is causing the market to move up and down. But that's OK, right? Crypto assets have also become more correlated with broader market trends, which is fine, right? But this all of this uncertainty that is actually going on is there because of, uh, you know, this crazy stuff happening in the world. And we need to protect our funds. We need to protect our investments in the best way possible. And my opinion is that in the future, we may actually see some benefits from central bank digital coins, which are highly uh, sought by, or sought out by central banks around the world. Over 100 countries, what you'll see uh, are actually focusing on CBDC. So just a reminder, a stable coin is a digital asset that aims to maintain the same value as a stable asset or a basket of goods. There's fiat backed, crypto backed, commodity backed and algorithmic stable coins such as UST. Now. Let's get into what exactly is a central bank digital currency. So they're all digital tokens. They're similar to cryptos, but they're issued by a central authority. So they're not decentralized. They are centralized. And the uh, core idea here is that they would allow the central bank to easily manipulate monetary and fiscal policies because they have control over the entire supply. Now, you may think, OK, this is no bueno, you know, because we have a decentralized thing, which would be, you know, the core idea of crypto turning into a centralized thing. But that's completely normal. Not every coin out there has to be centralized. If you want to take a risk, if you want to value your own privacy, if you want to value your decentralization, you can just hold Bitcoin or something, right? But if you value your security, the safety of your funds, you know, if something happens to your funds, the country is liable for it. You nothing can happen to your funds, right? So it does add a little bit of safety and it may even help the entire world transition into this more digital form of banking powered by the blockchain, right? And for me, that is perfect, right? For crypto, that's perfect. And it's a good way to be looking towards. Now, key takeaways, right? As usual from Investopedia, it's a digital form of a country's fiat currency. It's issued and regulated by nation's monetary authority or central bank. CBDCs promote financial inclusion and simplify the implementation of monetary and fiscal policy. It's a centralized form of currency, right? That may not keep transactions anonymous. And lastly, many countries are exploring 
how CBDCs will affect both their economies, but also their existing financial networks, implementing it and stability of the overall ecosystem. Now, understanding these CBDCs could, you know, be a little bit difficult at the start, but it's, it's pretty easy. You know, the idea is they're here to supplement physical money, just like we have, you know, all of these electronic forms of payment currently, uh, you know, with the work through a credit based model. But with CBDCs, it's just going to be a lot more efficient than what it is right now, because instead of having a credit based model, you just have an issuance based model of the CBDCs themselves. And, you know, some of the things that are, you know, the goals of these central bank digital currencies are, first of all, you know, many people in Africa, for example, and a lot of countries in the world don't really have access to financial services and CBDCs would make it very simple for them to actually take advantage of these services, right? Open up a, a savings account, be able to have money on the internet. Why? Well, because first of all, they need it. But second of all, central banks or governments can have that influence. They can uh, create a huge project that would give everyone, uh, you know, these uh, payment gateways, right? Where you can just use your phone, put it on the on the thing and, and pay with CBDCs because, you know, traditional uh, credit cards and all this stuff just don't simply exist in that region. And it's a lot easier to implement a CBDC than anything else. So it also reduces the risk of using digital currencies in their current form because, you know, first of all, the blockchain, um, but, you know, people who are still going to be using cryptocurrencies still have, you know, liability on their own side in case of some volatile moves up and down, which I think is perfectly fine. You know, in a perfect world, we're going to have centralized currencies just like we do right now with fiat, except it's all going to be on the blockchain in an ideal world. And we're also going to have decentralized currencies for those that want to play around. Now, are they going to regulate uh, the like a lot? Are they going to regulate the decentralized currencies once these CBDCs are out? Well, every country is going to be different. And as you're going to see in this next article from the IMF that I'm going to cover, it may actually be, uh, you know, a uh, little bit different uh, to the current currencies that we have out there, but I'll touch up on that in a second or two. So there's two types of CBDCs out there. You have wholesale CBDCs, which means that central banks grant institutions stuff, and you have retail CBDCs, which is uh, basically just eliminating intermediary risk for retail traders or, you know, retail usage of them. And intermediary risk is, you know, you holding your money in FTX and FTX collapsing and you losing your money. If you held it with a CBDC, in your favorite banks or your favorite country you know you wouldn't lose the money because the government would pay you out as per the you know contract right so some of the issues that cbdc's address and create and i'm going to drop this article down below and i really appreciate if you could drop a like and subscribe to the channel if you enjoyed it so far um, i'm going to try to just run you down through this but you can check out the article for some more detailed explanations some of the issues addressed by cbdc's are first of all free from credit and liquidity risk because there's no uh, credit when it comes to that and also the government is actually uh, backing it cross-border payment improvements right makes it a lot more simple and a lot more transactions per second than traditional swift or other payment methods supports the international role of the dollar and other currencies that are already huge out there financial inclusion for people who do not have access to financial services and it expands access to the general public now some of the issues that need addressing are financial structure changes, right? It's gonna be very difficult to move everything onto the blockchain. Financial system stability, everything is a, uh, you know, how do you call it, uh, uh, a scale when it comes to economics. And it's very important to do it properly and transition slowly, uh, otherwise the whole system can just collapse. Monetary policy influence, privacy protection, and cybersecurity as well are issues that need to be touched upon. But it's a very good thing that we have 100 countries already that are working towards CBDCs. And this is a article from this February um, from the IMF, right? The International Monetary Fund that says that central banks are actually rolling up their sleeves and starting to learn more and more about digital money. If CBDCs are des designed prudently or you know really well, they can potentially offer more resilience, more safety, greater availability and lower costs than private forms of digital money that we do see right now. Around 100 countries are exploring CBDCs currently and the IMF is deeply involved in this issue where, you know, there's already a few tests going on. In the Bahamas, for example, the sand dollar is out and it's been in circulation for more than a year. You can, you know, Google it real quick, see how it's going. Or, you know, if you comment down below, maybe I can film a video about it as well. 
Sweden's Riksbank has developed a proof of concept and is also exploring the CBDC. And in China, we have the ECNY or the E uh, Chinese Yuan that continues to progress with more than 100 million individual users and billions of Yuan in transactions. So China is, you know, probably the forefront player when it comes to this. And, uh, you know, it kind of makes sense, right? But uh, the Federal Reserve issued a report as well that noted that a CBDC could fundamentally change the structure of the US financial system, which also does make sense. Now, three key takeaways, and I'm going to leave it at that for this video. Lesson number one, no one size fits all. So what does this mean? It means that there's no universal case for CBDCs because each economy is completely different, right? So you cannot have a global world power CBDC. And that's why I don't fear that crypto is just going to disappear forever because some countries, you know, like the USA may say, OK, we're going to have this central bank digital currency and we're going to ban all cryptocurrencies that are decentralized. Right. Can they do that? They can't really ban it if it's truly decentralized like Bitcoin, unless they shut down electricity for the entire world. But, you know, let's say they have a very rough stance on it. But then you're going to have other countries such as, you know, Germany, which is very open to cryptocurrencies. It's going to say, OK, we're going to have a CBDC, but we're also going to allow you people to use decentralized coins. Why? Well, because, you know, the CBDC will guarantee regulation and security for, you know, some part of your funds and the others you can go and play around with them and, you know, get taxed as usual. And that would, you know, be in an ideal world now. Financial inclusion is very important when it comes to CBDCs, and it also could provide an essential backup for, you know, payment, you know, failing, uh, traditional payment systems failing. And, you know, those are some of the benefits that these CBDCs can actually provide. Now, lesson number two is it's very important to consider financial stability and privacy when it comes to designing these CBDCs. It's very important for wheels, so to speak, of the economy to run smoothly. So when uh, all of this is being done and when they're going to be implemented in the future, as I said, everything is a scale and it has to be done very, very carefully. So what they did in uh, Bahamas, China and the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union, they actually placed limits on holdings of CBDCs to prevent outflows of bank deposits into CBDC. So what could happen if they didn't put these limits? People would, you know, massively go to the bank, for example, withdraw their funds and want to put their funds in the CBDC. So then you're thinking, OK, that's great. We have a lot of users now, but the bank collapsed. Right. And you cannot have the central bank having that uh, solvency and liquidity pressure on it. Also, it helps meet people's design desire for uh, privacy when it comes to these uh, limits of holding uh, CBDCs. So, you know, this is some stuff that, uh, you know, will uh, result in less illicit outflows of money and in the future it's going to be upgraded more and more and lesson number three and the final thing for today's video without you know uh, holding you too much longer we're finding the delicate balance between developments of the design and you know the policy front so it's uh, very important to have both of these done correctly if a cbdc is going to be perfect and you know you have to build trust right banks that are there for you know five years are you really going to trust them well not really but banks that are out there for 50 years such as central banks out in every country of the world you got to have a little bit of faith in the banking system now i know that a lot of us here have tinfoil hats on and that we don't like the banking system and that's why we like uh, cryptocurrencies but at the same time you know you have to trust something that's proven and if it's there for a long time it's proven and uh, you know the same is going to have to happen with cbdc's right why do we trust ethereum because it's solving problems it's working they're delivering and and we trust it right why do we not trust ftx well because they messed up you know so cbdc's will also have to climb this ladder but they will have backing from the government as well which is going to make it uh, completely all right so the history of money in conclusion is entering a new chapter and we're here to see it and whenever you know i see some more news on cbdc's i'll be sure to update you here on the satoshi club before you see it anywhere else so thanks for taking the time to watch this video i hope you guys enjoyed it make sure to drop a like subscribe to the channel if you enjoyed it drop a comment down below if you have any questions for me or suggestions for a future video and uh yeah lastly i'm not a financial advisor you should do your own due diligence before investing into anything in the blockchain or crypto world. And with that being said, I guess I'll see you guys in the next one.